I'm back. I apologize for my lengthy hiatus. If you want to know why I was gone for so long, well, I posted everything on Twitter already a couple months ago, maybe three months ago, and I'm not going to rehash it here on, on YouTube. So first thing, I had originally scheduled me and Don to do a podcast review of this book, but we could never get our schedules to line up. So rather than scrap the whole thing, I decided instead to produce a video series diving into what I consider are some of the major fundamental flaws of this book. Now I am aware that this review is a little bit Johnny come lately. Nevertheless, I think there is a lot that can still be unpacked here. So the first thing I want to talk about is this thing called white fragility. This term which originates with D'Angelo is born out of a confluence of both critical race theory and critical whiteness studies. Now to define this term white fragility, I always prefer going straight to the sources ad fontes. So I'll allow Robin D'Angelo in her own words uh, to describe for you what this concept means. White fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. These behaviors, in turn, function to reinstate white racial equilibrium. Now, that quote is straight from her own academic paper published in 2011 in the International Journal of Critical Pedagogy and is the exact same quote used again on page two of her book, White Fragility. So let me unpack this quote because there's a lot happening here. Robin D'Angelo is conceptualizing this term, white fragility, uh, to refer to white people's reaction to the charge of their own complicity in the racist structure of society. And that any occurrence of this thing she calls white fragility is a powerful means of both racial control and the protection of white advantage. And what this book is designed to do is to help white people accept their racism, strive to be less white, be less fragile, break with white silence and with white solidarity, call it out, and begin a lifelong process of self-reflection and putting theory into practice. Now you may be asking, why would I do these things? Well, according to D'Angelo, until white people confront their racism and do the work to dismantle white supremacy, then the reproduction of racial inequality will continue to persist. And although this work of challenging their own racism is a never-ending, lifelong process. It is also, according to D'Angelo, incredibly liberating and personally deeply transforming. Now, all of those words and phrases that I just used are not mine, but are instead taken straight from her book. Now, I want to ask you to keep everything I just said in the back of your mind because we're going to come back to it. But first, I want to elaborate upon a fallacy called the Kafka Trap. And once I explain this fallacy, I promise to tie this back into Robin D'Angelo's main thesis. Now, a Kafka trap is a fallacy in which a denial of an accusation is taken as confirmation of that accusation. So let me say that again. A Kafka trap is a fallacy in which denial of an accusation is taken as confirmation or proof of that accusation. This line of reasoning is false. Just because you are accused of something doesn't make it true or that guilt has been established. Let's use what is called the classic witch hunting example to demonstrate this fallacy in action. Denying that you are a witch is itself proof that you are a witch because witches always deny being witches. Did you spot the fallacy? Denial of being a witch is taken as proof or confirmation of being a witch. It's a heads I win, tails you lose. You cannot extricate yourself from it because how the statement is framed 
means that the outcome is already predetermined. Now, although this example is fairly simple, it proves a profound point, which is the very real danger of what happens when people employ this false line of reasoning called a Kafka trap. And history is replete with such examples. And that danger is not only harder to spot, but compounded when this trap is hidden and set under layers upon layers of academic prose and scholarly jargon. I want to break this down some more because this is very important. A Kafka trap is in one sense a very sophisticated rhetorical trick that unless you're aware of it, you'll struggle to disentangle yourself from it. How I look at a Kafka trap is that it's a combination of multiple fallacies all rolled into one. A Kafka trap contains right out of the gate what is called petitio principii, a begging the question. It does this by making an assertion, a claim, or an assumption. It assumes the very thing it should be proving. It asserts or claims the very thing that it needs to first prove. And in so doing, it is both unfair and false. It is more along the lines of a character assassination rather than proof. A Kafka trap also contains what is called a loaded question or loaded statement, which means that it contains within it the presumption of guilt. It's not asking for clarification or for truth, but agreement, as it severely limits the range of options available so that the desired outcome is already guaranteed and any defense is precluded. This is also called presenting a false dilemma or the either or fallacy. It constrains one's choices down to only a few options, either this option or that option. It leaves out what is called in Latin a tertium quid, a third option. A classic example of this fallacy is the famous courtroom line of questioning, such as, are you still beating your wife? Are you still mistreating your children? Or are you still cheating on your taxes? If you say no to any of those questions, you are still guilty. And if you say yes, well, then you've only admitted or confessed to your guilt. Each one of those questions is an attack upon the person's character, presumes guilt, limits the choices available, and in so doing, reaches an already pre-established conclusion. And in this sense, a Kafka trap is really about framing. And understanding this is so important. Because there's a strategy or ulterior motive at play when someone uses a Kafka trap. And that strategy is as old as time, which is this. He or she who controls the framing of an argument usually wins the argument. Let me say that again. Whoever controls the framing controls the debate, controls the outcome. And Kafka traps are very sneaky in that sense. Let me give you two more examples of how unfair they are. Suppose you are in the middle of a heated disagreement with someone. They have unfairly accused you of doing something bad. And in the middle of defending yourself, they turn to you and say, you talk too much. Only someone who is guilty would talk this much. Now, how do you proceed? Because the moment you open your mouth to defend yourself, you've proven their point. And yet, if you stand there silently, you have this accusation hanging over you. You can't argue against the accusation without at the same time condemning yourself. Why? Because they control the framing of the argument. And that is one of the more hidden and insidious aspects of this false form of argumentation. Framing is really about control. Limiting the information or the choices available is to control you. Now, with this knowledge, let me give you another example. This one will be visual. Now, we've all seen these posters and heard the phrase that silence is violence. But think about what this person is claiming. When someone claims that silence is violence, what they are doing is framing the message in such a way that refusing to speak out is now an indication of your complicity, your guilt, and your tacit agreement with some new form of social injustice. And I want to use this last example to highlight something I don't think a lot of people are aware of. 
And that is the tendency that many people have of seeing this fallacy as only occurring in the abstract or theoretical dimension. However, one of the strengths of informal fallacies, including the Kafka trap, is their ability to cross that line from the purely theoretical and into the concrete. Now, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here, but this will tie in with my last point. And I need to preface what I'm about to say. This will sting, but more people need to hear this. I still keep hearing people repeat this talking point that they've obviously gotten from one or two news channels. And it's this not well thought out proposition that Antifa is only an idea. And to that I say, yes, yes, Antifa is an idea and more. But that idea is exactly what makes it so dangerous. Ideas have consequences and bad ideas have bad consequences. Saying that Antifa is just an idea is to not understand the power of dangerous ideas or history for that matter. Because if anything, the history of the world is the history of ideas being played out on a world stage. History is the battleground of ideas. And one would think that after the previous century of the untold amounts of human bloodshed, insane suffering, and monumental death and destruction that occurred because of the power of ideas, that this brutal lesson of history would in the very least enter into people's minds and caution them from making such inane pronouncements that it's only an idea. Furthermore, it's exactly when bad ideas cross that threshold from the abstract into the concrete that it may actually be too late. Let me say that again. It's exactly when bad ideas cross that threshold from the abstract to the concrete that it may already be too late. That's the most frightening part. And contrary to academia, Hollywood, and the media, Ideas don't exist in some sort of vacuum or ethereal world. They exist in the minds of people. They are embodied in people and become actualized. Ideas don't burn down buildings, but people with dangerous ideas do. When people repeat that phrase, Antifa is just an idea, it's like they've downloaded a script that they are not even aware of possessing and are just repeating. There's no depth of thought or nuance behind it. And this is because the conclusions they've drawn are not their own, which actually saddens me because these are my fellow human beings. I'm not any better than them, but they are just unaware of just how massive the information is and yet how narrow the framing is behind the information they think they are receiving. Now, getting back to the Kafka trap, I want to give one last example, which ties in with what I just said. Imagine you are out with your family, enjoying the day, minding your own business, when all of a sudden you find yourself engulfed in the midst of a very angry, agitated, large crowd, and you've somehow stumbled into a moving wave of protesters, all walking around with their posters, bullhorns, chanting, and raised fist, and they begin looking at you to see what you're going to do. Now think about this. You and your family went from minding your own business and enjoying your day to where now the onus is on you. Do you raise your fist or bend the knee or do you stand on your principles? In other words, a real life physical frame has now been dumped on you. You've entered a human Kafka trap. And here's the truly disturbing part. You might actually feel sympathy for this cause, and you might even agree with parts of it, but you disagree with the symbolism of the raised fist because you're smart and you know the history behind it and what it stands for. But at that moment, none of that matters. Nuance doesn't matter. Nuance has been eliminated. An either or choice has been thrusted upon you and your family because you've entered into a frame, or to be more precise, a frame has been forced upon you. You just went from minding your own business to a white supremacist in a matter of seconds. That's the nature of the Kafka trap, the reality of bad ideas. 
you have entered the absurd or the absurdity of the moment is forcing itself ruthlessly upon you. A Kafka trap is insidious because the trap is sprung on you without your permission. Now, please understand that when this fallacy is employed, it is done tactically to get you to either comply or expose you. It creates and squeezes you into a false dilemma, a false dichotomy, and says choose. And in so doing, it destroys choice and any sense of nuance, which means it oversimplifies everything. Now, I really want everyone who is listening or watching this to try to learn how to spot this bad faith argumentative tactic and call it out when it happens. Refuse to go along with it by exposing it. Now, if you study older logic textbooks like I do because I'm a book nerd, this fallacy usually goes by the older name poisoning the well rather than the Kafka trap, which is a fairly recent term but the fallacy is the same. Okay, so now that we've learned what a Kafka trap is, let's bring back in Robin D'Angelo's concept of white fragility and see what we can find. To do this, I'm going to put on the screen a quote from page two of her book, and I want you to focus on how she frames this concept of white fragility and how she frames any objections to it. We perceive any attempt to connect us to the system of racism as an unsettling and unfair moral offense. The smallest amount of racial stress is intolerable. The mere suggestion that being white has meaning often triggers a range of defensive responses. These include emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and withdrawal from the stress-inducing situation. These responses work to reinstate white equilibrium as they repel the challenge, return our racial comfort, and maintain our dominance within the racial hierarchy. I conceptualize this process as white fragility. The white fragility is triggered by discomfort and anxiety. It is born of superiority and entitlement. Now, the section I want to focus on is right there in the middle of this paragraph. And I ask, do you spot the fallacy? Do you notice how she frames any objection to the charge of racism? She says in her own words that the smallest amount of racial stress triggers a range of defensive responses, which include anger, fear, and guilt and behaviors such as arguing, silence, and withdrawal. So what has she done? She has framed her position in such a way that any reasonable objection to the charge of racism is now confirmation of racism. She has just accused all white people of being racist, and any objection to that highly controversial and insulting charge, which tends to get people upset when you call them a racist, is now taken as evidence of their racism. Let me say that another way. She has hedged her position in such a way that it can only lead to one conclusion, one outcome, which is agreement with her position. In other words, any objection to her argument is confirmation of her argument. Any objection is explained away as an example of white fragility. You can never disagree with her because the moment you disagree is the very moment you are displaying white fragility, which means you are refusing, according to her, to dismantle racism because it maintains white equilibrium and your dominance within the racial hierarchy. I want to hammer this out further because I want to stress the evil nature of this tactic. Imagine having to attend one of D'Angelo's DEI seminars one of her diversity, equity, and inclusion workshops because your workplace has made it mandatory. She's introduced and immediately she states her main thesis that all the white people in the room are racist and are complicit in upholding racism, of upholding a system of oppression, of white supremacy. And as she says this, everyone in the room has a different reaction. A couple people in the front row say out loud, Hey, that's not fair. I'm not a racist. Well, according to D'Angelo, 
this defensive response is simply confirmation of their unchecked racism. This outburst is confirmation of her concept, white fragility, which is the inability of white people to sit comfortably with the charge of being called racist. Framing, presumption of guilt, limitation of choices, loaded statements, false dilemma, petitio principii, begging the question, Kafka trap. Now let's take another person in this room. She hears the charge of racism, but she goes quiet. She sits there silently and doesn't say anything. Maybe she's contemplating what D'Angelo has just said. Or maybe she's sympathetic to what has just been said. Or maybe she's just shy. Well, none of that matters. Nuance doesn't matter. Because her silence, according to D'Angelo, is affirmation of white fragility, which is again affirmation of this woman's racism. Let's pick a third person. They see what is happening. And they quietly say to themselves, I want no part of this. And they slowly begin to withdraw from this highly toxic environment. Well, once again, according to Robin D'Angelo, this is what? This is also a sign of white fragility. And again, is confirmation of this person's racism. Framing, presumption of guilt, limitation of choices, loaded statements, false dilemma, petitio principii, begging the question, Kafka trap. Now, let's up the ante and take a look at a couple of other people in this struggle session. One happens to be an older black man and the other one a young Native American woman. And they both recoil in horror and object to their co-workers, some of which are their best friends, of being accused of racism. Now, surely Robin D'Angelo cannot charge them, these two people of color, for defending their co-workers, their friends, from the charges of racism. She can't possibly accuse these two people of white fragility, can she? Oh, you of little knowledge. What Robin D'Angelo and this whole critical race theory movement does to people of color is quite possibly worse than being accused of racism. This is the evil dark side, the disgusting underbelly of critical race theory, that very few people are aware of. Now, why do I say that? Well, to answer that question, I need to turn to another book written by Robin DiAngelo and Oslem Sensoy called Is Everyone Really Equal? And on page 72 of the second edition, they elaborate upon this concept called internalized oppression. And they state this, internalized oppression refers to internalizing and acting out often unintentionally the constant message that you and your group are inferior to the dominant group. Examples include seeking the approval of and spending most of your time with members of the dominant group, behaving in ways that please the dominant group and do not challenge the legitimacy of its position, and having low expectations for yourself and others associated with your group. So what does this mean exactly? It means that if you are a person of color, and you come to the defense of another human being who was falsely being accused of racism, then you are out of step with your collective group because you have somehow internalized the dominant group's oppressive messaging, this racist system of white supremacy, so deeply into your thinking that you now possess an inferior view of yourself and your group. And this internalization manifest itself possibly unintentionally by acting out or going against your own group. In other words, you've internalized the image of your oppressor into your very being, into who you are. You have adopted what is called a false consciousness and are no longer thinking as a member of your assigned group. Furthermore, this is a very dangerous territory for a person of color to occupy because if you're not careful, you might be labeled, according to these critical race theorists, as acting white, white adjacent, possessing a double consciousness, or quite possibly the worst charge of all, of being a racial traitor. Now, all of that language that I just used is straight from the teachings of critical race theory. 
Not only does this concept of internalized oppression rely upon Marxist categories and unprovable assumptions, but the core of it depends upon mind reading, self projection, the mystification of this internalization process begs the question, assumes the very thing it should be proving, limits the choices available to only two groups, and in so doing, interprets groups of people as some sort of frozen monolithic entity with no diversity of opinion, thoughts, or beliefs. Do you not see the Kafka trap embedded once again in this theory, in the theory of internalized oppression? Do you not see how tyrannical this belief system is, how condescending this concept is, how dehumanizing this belief system is, and how infantilizing this movement called critical race theory is towards people of color? What I'm going to say next is also going to sting. If you are Native American, why would you flirt with or adopt a belief system that simply continues another form of the legacy of paternalism. Why would you allow these progressives, these progressive elites, to define what being native is or isn't? Doesn't that right belong to each tribal member and each heterogeneous tribe? Why would you adopt a system of thought that undermines tribal autonomy? Why would you sell your birthright, your mind and your spirit to a system of thought that demands that you conform to its beliefs, that demands that you assimilate to its beliefs. Otherwise, you're not native. Those aren't my words, but hers. Those aren't my beliefs, but those are the beliefs of these critical race theorists. Look, I get it. You don't know me. So why should you trust me? Which is a totally reasonable position to take. So don't take my word for it. Go to the sources. Do your own research. But please stop allowing the talking heads on TV to frame this belief system as left versus right, as Democrat versus Republican, or Trump supporters versus Biden supporters. This issue is bigger than all of that. Don't fall into the media's framing trap that there is only two choices available. I could go on, but I hope I've made my point. Any disagreement with this theory is affirmation of this theory. All roads are closed except agreement, which means that this theory, as I've said before in other videos, is unfalsifiable. And a theory that is impossible to falsify and does not accept counter evidence is no longer theory but dogma, which means it is held as an article of faith, which means it is either a religion or a cult. This fallacy is nothing more than a grown-up, sophisticated form of bullying that used to only occur when we were kids on the playground. If you had siblings, you probably remember this fallacy. The older sibling accuses the younger sibling of being a crybaby, to which the younger sibling says, no, I'm not. I'm not a crybaby. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. I'm telling mom. See, I told you so. You're a crybaby. Ladies and gentlemen, that fallacy that playground bullying tactic has now graduated into academia and into the media and now comes dressed up in academic garb and technical sociological language to hide itself. Now, I want to close with something positive, which is that whenever this fallacy is employed, whoever employs it is actually showing the weakness of their argument. They have to resort to sophisticated character assassination because they know they have no arguments and no evidence to support their weak, pseudo-scientific position. Non ducor duco. I am not led. I lead.